Everything we know, from people and ants, to stars and galaxies, to quarks and atoms, the entire universe, might just be a simulation running inside a supercomputer inside an even bigger universe. Ancient philosophers said that the universe is a dream that we're waiting to wake up from. In this dream world of the imagination, anything is possible. All cultural items, from the dreams of our rodent-like ancestors, to books, to television shows, are merely permutations of the reality we think we live in. Today's age of computers and video games places simulations at the center of our cultural consciousness. A select group of us perform simulations for fun and profit, and we call them games, role-playing and otherwise. We live to run simulations. Join us on the Simulationist podcast as we explore our culture of simulation. Hello, once again, welcome to another iteration of the Simulationist podcast. This is the 70th of these things that we're doing. And today is the 5th of January, 2014. Happy New Year. There. Happy New Year. Uh, my name is Josh Levin. With me, as always, on the other microphone... Ryan Kirkby, co-host extraordinaire. <laughs> yeah, my... Uh, okay. So, uh, I think there's one thing I want to start off with this week. Is uh, something uh, fun in the news. Is uh, People seem to love reporting back and forth and back and forth. And it hits like, the Twitter feeds and it hits the, uh, the Facebook and it goes its way through... Uh, how earlier this week in Canada it was colder than Mars. <laughs> Canada part well in like not, not just not Canada. all of Canada, but there was a nice uh, big cold wave that was coming on down, um, and so it managed to hit with some pretty nasty temperatures. Uh, but you're talking about Toronto, right? Uh, Toronto was the one that everyone keeps okay. mentioning because uh, it was also uh, thanks to uh, an uh, ice rainstorm uh, knocked like, tens of thousands of people without power. Yeah. So I mentioned, oh, it's cold and horrible there, but I think they got the power up to almost almost everybody, if not everybody. And then the big cold front comes on down, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's 50 below. Yeah. <laughs> this water main has burst, but that's okay. We're not losing a lot of water pressure because it's frozen already. Yeah, yeah, that happened. So, and Toronto's not even, I mean, Toronto's a very southern part of Canada, so there it's, are parts Yeah, this of is Canada. basically where Canada in, starts trying to inject itself into America. I always see Southern Ontario as <laughs> yeah. some sort of like hypodermic needle thing going on there. Uh, yeah, I think it has more to do with the lakes. It's a Great Lakes thing, but you know <laughs> that's how I see it whenever I'm looking at Ontario. It's like, oh, that's the stinger. Ah, yes. I don't know if anyone else thinks that way, but that's how I think, and that's how I, how I imagine it. But yeah, it's it's not like it's it's up, you know, like on the shores of the Hudson Bay. It's you know not up over on Victoria Island or on you know in the you know the Arctic Circle. This yeah. is a, about as southern, you know, into Canada as you can find. Yeah, it's Toronto, one of the larger cities in the world, too. Yeah, yeah. and so, yeah, 50 below zero. Eh, wow, that's that's cold. That's, yeah. Unfortunately, they're comparing that with some of the better parts of Mars. Yeah, Mars in the sun. Mars in the sun <laughs> is only 28 below zero. I yeah. mean, you can go out in your shorts and shirt then, apparently. Unfortunately, uh, the truth is, if you go into the shade on Mars, it's like 80 below. And then, you know, you go into the nighttime temperatures and things get, you know, just absolutely god-awful. Yeah, yeah. Um, but still, 50 below is still nothing to sneeze at. I, I won't they say, like, oh, Toronto can't handle 50 degrees below zero. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely unpleasant, yeah. But it's something you can technically live with, with a little preparation, and it's not going to, like, eh, you know, if you're unprepared, you know, you will start freezing your skin in five minutes or so. Yeah, and this is what we we have stories about Mars, and we, we talk about colonizing Mars, because it's it's a relatively, I mean, as far as planets go, it's a relatively livable world. Although I still say if we could uh, get rid of some of the clouds around Venus, we could help out, uh, get rid of their uh, out-of-control uh, uh, greenhouse effect, and that would be a great place to live. But that requires a lot of, you know, that's a lot of a fixer-upper before you can do anything. <laughs> that's like you got to get yeah. people in orbit doing things before you can ever touch ground. And yeah. that's like generations. Mars, Mar heck, my daughter's one year old, and she could probably wind up stepping foot on Mars sometime within her lifetime. And that's not just, you know, like, oh, my God, I'm like so, so far out, you know, just broadcasting the future. That's considered a feasible and reasonable concept. Yeah. Well, the yeah, children of today could yeah. be setting foot on Mars. Yeah, technologically, I think... It's basically it's something that's possible to do. It's just a question of when the budget will be there and all that. 
how big of a demand will it take to get people doing that? Yeah. Um, but I, I found this one interesting because uh, this week I also watched some Batman. Uh, it was the Adam West Batman. It had uh, Mr. Freeze in there. And Mr. Freeze was keeping Batman imperiled. He was trapped, not by any real cage, but uh, because Mr. Freeze had most of the place where he was at kept at 50 degrees below zero. And that struck me as, well, 50 below zero again. No, that's 50 below Fahrenheit. Yeah. As opposed to 50 below Celsius. Isn't that, don't they, they... They converge at they 40 below. It. Yeah, at 40 below, it's the same thing. If, if they say it's 40 below outside, you say, is it Celsius or Fahrenheit? You go both. Oh, people always say that, and okay, I believe that for 40 below, but when you go lower than that, do they cross? Like, they cross over each other? or how um, do, No. Or do they stay the same after that? No, they, they they keep going along their respective uh, degrees sort of thing. So 50 below, you know, Celsius is not the same as 50 below Fahrenheit. Yeah. But it's not by that much of a difference. 10 degrees is 10 degrees. Um, and yeah, it doesn't really matter at that point. <laughs> at that point, but... Uh, they were acting as though with like Batman takes as soon as he takes a step outside he's ah falling on the ground like it's cold or the shock of such a drastic temperature difference is going to kill him in seconds. And I'm yeah. watching this I'm thinking, you know what? The people in Toronto and their you know and like their heated homes if someone needs to go to the corner store to to go get something, you know it's like we need supplies, get it now just in case it all freezes up and we can't get out later. They're going from, you know, about the same temperature difference. You don't see them curling up into a ball saying, Oh, I wish I was wearing my bath thermal underwear. Well, if they, if they weren't wearing any clothes, I would expect, yeah, they would probably... Well, I mean, let's face it, with, in most cases with Batman, he's not wearing a lot of clothes. Batman is not what you consider appropriately dressed for 50 below zero. Uh, well, he is and he isn't, because, I mean, yeah, obviously the costumes don't look that way. But sort of the mythology around Batman is that yes, he's he's got some high tech thermal underwear that does. In this case, yes, he actually was specially prepared, and he did fake out Mister Freeze by by falsely pretending to be like almost incapacitated from the cold as soon as he stepped out of his uh, little yeah. prison area. Uh, and that was kind of nice. I mean, at least that's a Batman thinking. And say what you want about the Adam West Batman. Hey, apparently he can outthink the villains. Yeah. That might <laughs> not be saying thing, much, yeah. but you know he can outthink them. Yeah. Um, I just found it interesting that it, with Batman, it's 50 below zero. That's where Mr. Freeze likes. So you can think of this with in terms of fiction as two different ways. Uh, one, you could have a wonderful story about Gotham in the winter getting a cold snap and Mr. Freeze is walking around, not in his like big cryo tanks, you know, mobile suit. But he's just walking around, you know, in like, you know, Bermuda shorts, you know, and <laughs> a Hawaiian t-shirt. Yeah. He's walking around having fun, you know. He's got his cold gun with him in case anyone tries anything, but no. He's he's having fun there. He's he's, he's okay in this weather. That's where he's able to to live like a normal human being. Yeah. Or two, you can look at this as as like uh, the comic book artist just you know picking like like a random number out of the thing. It's like oh fifty below. Uh, well, I think I got down to twenty five below. I was really cold. So fifty below must be like lethal, right? Without you know bothering to look. Well, mind you, with the Adam West stuff, uh, their authors didn't have the internet, so you can't just say you know what is it like at fifty below zero. Yeah, although, well, wouldn't comic book offices have things like the Encyclopedia Britannica, sort of like an office copy or something like that? They likely do now. It is much more prevalent to have that, or at least proper, you know, well, now like a search internet. engine, yeah. But uh, apparently, no. Stan Lee um, knew just enough about uh, science to make science fiction kind of work. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, how does, how does a young man get, you know, the powers of a spider? It's radioactive. So he knows the word radioactive. He knows radioactive and he knows it's a transitive property that something that is radioactive could make something else radioactive. Mm -hmm. And so he applied that, you know, in, in, a, in a more mythological sense of, you know, A affecting B and, you know, transitive properties with, oh, radioactive spider bites translates into, you know, spider powers. Well, I mean... At another level, um, radioactivity does affect DNA. Um, Not in it, any uh, <laughs> mutational properties. Uh, well, it sort of ruins it, but yeah. also it's possible that it might ruin some inhibitory thing, like, you know, a growth hormone or something, so that, you know, your muscles just don't stop. Yeah, you've got spider cancer. <laughs> well, yeah, sure, it'd be in one way it's cancer, but it might be... Which, you know, by the way, might be a really interesting story idea for Spider-Man. 
because he is technically, you know, at some degree, he she shows up a little bit on radiation. If you got a, a high enough counter, Peter Parker blips. Oh, he's, he, yeah. yeah, he's radioactive. Not not to the <laughs> point where he's a danger, but he has been dosed with more radioactivity at one point than any person really should have on a healthy degree. So mm-hmm. the concept of Peter Parker having a tumor could be a very interesting storyline that just doesn't get covered by many other heroes. And yet, because of his origin, it makes a bit of sense. Yeah. I know they did something similar with Superman because, you know, he got exposed to kryptonite and that caused, like, kryptonite poisoning and he got, like, like cancerous lumps. But they shrunk people down and they fought inside his body to cure the cancer. So <laughs> I think he could go well with a real, more human uh, perspective from this. So I'm just putting that out there in case you think of writing. I want to write a Spider-Man script, but what can I do that will really get attention? Well, yeah. Spider-Man gets cancer. The, the Marvel Universe has, like... I mean, mutants are fairly prominent. The the whole mm-hmm. concept of humans ch- being changed, and so you'd think that yeah, mutants mutates is, and all that other yeah, various cancer things. goes hand in hand with that sort of. And it really doesn't happen, but uh, with with Marvel, I think because it's it's much more of a personal level. Yeah. Um, you know, in this case, it wouldn't actually be Spider Man gets cancer; it's Peter Parker gets cancer. Yeah, yeah. He finds out. And so I think you could have a really interesting storyline done that way in realizing that, yeah, you can beat the crap out of Doc Ock, but no, you're going to wind up uh, still, you know, going to the dock and looking all meek because it's like, what if this is bad? What if it's metastasized? <laughs> and the story doesn't need to be too big and all that. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, it was a simple thing. We believe it's benign. There was a quick operation. You're out at the end of the next day sort of <laughs> yeah. thing, you know. Well, I mean... But at least to, yeah. to put the perspective through and educate a little bit, you could have something easily as good a storyline, if you know what you're doing, as uh, the whole bit about uh, Speedy, uh, the, uh, you know, the Green Arrow sidekick uh, getting hooked on crack cocaine. Yeah, sort of real life, yeah, real life stories. Yeah, something that could really get people and really make them see that, yeah, even if you're a hero, you're still a person. And thus vice versa, by acting properly as a person in the face of uh, something as scary as cancer, you can be heroic in nature. So uh, you could do yeah. some very nice things if you're a proper enough artist, a uh, writer, to make the whole thing work. Now, uh, Superman or Spider-Man isn't the only hero that got his powers from radiation or radioactivity because Hulk... Uh, oh yeah, he got really got just bombarded. <laughs> blasted with gamma rays. But for some reason, I don't think the Hulk could wind up doing it right, because he transforms so much. It's like, Bruce Banner, you've got cancer. That makes me angry. He hulks out, punches the cancer into submission, and then goes back. And it just <laughs> seems like that's how it would wind up being. If Peter yeah. Parker gets cancer, it's something that really becomes deep, and you know, something he has to think about. Yeah. Something that, you know, like, like, how does this affect him? How does this affect him as a hero? With the Hulk, it's like, oh, Hulk smash puny cancer until he beats it out of his own body. So, I don't know how well it works with gamma radiation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in the fictional universe, of course. In the real universe, uh, we haven't even gotten off the ground. <laughs> no, no, no. We're, we're, we're confined to conventional radiation sources. Nothing that's got transit of mutational properties. Yeah. But yeah, so, so I back, back from that tangent. Um, the concept of 50 below zero being something that's like uh, only you know any human supervillain could withstand... It's like, no, mm-hmm. all you got to do is be as tough as, uh, just as tough as someone from Toronto. Yeah, or like, or Finland. You oh, know yeah. how the Finnish people have those uh, uh, saunas and then they jump out of the sauna into the ice water. And I, I guess the ice water probably isn't minus 50. No, I think it, it wind up being just at freezing. But that's still a be, pretty big shock yeah. to the system. Um, <laughs> which is yeah. why it's apparently good for your immune system that way. Is it keeps yeah. your, your body on high alert. Good for you. Okay, yeah. Um, or that's what they say, and, you know, their health records seem to bear that out. Um, so do you think, like, imagine if there's a colony on Mars, like, you know, in 100, 200 years from now, and they have, they've they developed their own, like, culture and everything. Do you think they'll have guys on Mars who do the whole, like, get in a sauna and then run out into the, um, you know, hold their breath and run out into the open? The and terraforming landscape of, of Mars and, you know, just roll around until they're all red yeah. and they hop back in? Yeah. What if it works the other way? What if you spend time on Mars and because the sun's so much further away, you get more used to colder temperatures and then what they do is they, they, they get like hot boxes of, you know, where the whole thing is just like a, just a designed to collect, you know, the solar radiation and things warm up to okay. 30 degrees above zero. <laughs> how long can you stand the heat dip, baby? Um, sure, yeah. Maybe that's how the culture goes and they, they 
30 degrees above zero. That's ludicrous. I mean, only an inhuman supervillain could withstand that sort of heat. You'd have to be, you'd have to be some sort of super orca character to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think probably what's going to happen, like, I'm only thinking that it's 100, 200 years, so they won't have made a lot of progress on things like evolution and, you know, stuff like that. Well, then, you know, we are learning all sorts of fun things about genetics and epigenetics, so there may be some epigenetic mm-hmm. things we wind up doing that would look like either an evolutionary jump or genetic tampering to uh, the current uh, layman's eyes. But I'd imagine probably the technological challenge of heating your living space is not excessive, so it probably would be more worth it to heat the space than to better adapt insulation. Then, yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, people are going to wind up adapting anyways to Mars just because yeah. of the gravity difference. Yeah, they all adapt. Be to prepared gravity, for yeah. lots of really tall people, skinny people uh, from Mars. I guess that's. Makes sense, yeah. The gravity really won't weigh so much down on them, and it'll cause some weird uh, differences. Uh, I, I expect taller people on Mars uh, as they continue to uh, to have a stable breeding uh, colony. Well, I don't know how true I'm speaking on that. <laughs> I'm not, you know, a, a xenobiologist thinking about the future of humanity on other planets yet. Yeah, Maybe if there's a field for me to pick. I think that also might be one of the things where you just have to test it because there are competing factors like there might be a, a factor to do with gravity that somehow makes you not grow as tall so that, like not having the resistance doesn't mean means the bones don't have the impetus to grow certain lengths or whatever so you just wind up becoming like really skinny then maybe skinny yeah so you maybe. don't need so much muscle mass to move your body around yeah so you just be ooh, just a bunch of stick men on mars yeah. or or you might uh you might just have a lot of fat <laughs> oh, because it's cold, yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes more like like a, some sort of... You, you're not any bigger or smaller. You're just proportionally more fat. Yeah. And so the concept of somebody being like 25% you know, fat by volume is not seen as being obese. It's like, ah, you're well insulated and a healthy specimen of Mars. Good yeah, going. It, it might. I mean, yeah, this is all speculation, of course, but that might be a thing. And so that's half the fun of, 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 of like creating a novel of what life is going to be like on Mars, is you come up with yeah. these speculations and you run with them. And who cares if you wind up being wrong in the end, as long as you write a decent story about the crazy people on Mars that are 25% fat because they need to be to keep warm. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, that's inter- an interesting thought in itself. I don't know, like... Can you, if you want to turn that into a, a novel or a story, well, like, the thing is, it, it you would, need a hook. Well, it could be just the same basic story as you know, life on Earth, except you've got all these extra accoutrements. And then you know, it's, it's the same as seeing stuff on Star Trek. Yeah. The aliens have weird foreheads. How does that change things? Really, it shouldn't. But the fact mm-hmm. that you know, there's a Vulcan and a Klingon, you know, arguing because they're trapped in a small area. Does that really make much more of a difference uh, uh, as to how the story goes, as opposed to a hot-headed man and a uh, like a you know a statistician trapped from a zombie apocalypse on Earth? It technically doesn't. It's yeah. the scenery that changes, yeah. and that in the end, is, you know, is, is what draws the people in to hear what's otherwise a good story that can be told anywhere in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So it could be the story of a family, you know, you know, uh, just just having family problems. Uh, the thing is, they're all really weirdly skinny with a lot of fat. You know, <laughs> you got to eat your fat there, Sonny. You know, otherwise you're going to become only twenty percent fat, and you're going to be shivering everywhere. The Martian family or something. Yeah. Swiss, the Swiss Family Martian. <laughs> I think. I well, think maybe they, if the Swiss beat us to Mars. But I think it's probably going to yeah. be one of them joint UN things. Everyone of all developed nations can wind up going. Um, yeah. Provided probably. they're appropriately skilled. I mean. Nobody that you know that doesn't have any proper skills would wind up going. You know, it, it'd be it'd be interesting, like if looking back in fifty years, like saying like, oh, this was the beginning of China's great space age, and maybe China will will do it, ah. do all that stuff. But I mean, you can't. It's hard to tell. Well, they do seem to have the desire to do this stuff. I mean, you know, NASA's doing these proper tests. China really does seem to want it more. Maybe, yeah. So I'll give them that. You know, they 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 want it. They they they've got a hunger for it. So I won't they say I'm out of any uh, a space race or contest. But uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, back from a few tangents, that was uh, the, <laughs> the news <laughs> yeah. for this week. Yeah, um, talking about how cold it is. Fifty below <laughs> zero in Canada, and 
how some people seem to think that's an inhuman temperature. And it's like, no, you just be properly prepared and just yeah, don't go do anything stupid up. outdoors these days. Yeah. Said from a guy living in, you know, Victoria, where it got down to seven degrees. <laughs> Ooh. I had to scrape my windshield off. It took me two minutes. Ooh. Ooh. Well, has it, it's been below zero this year. But it? not by very much. It's gotten just below zero. Um, I do know I did fishtail it a little bit when I was driving my car to work today. But, I mean, that... You know, that just happens when you have to make a 90 degree turn on a place that hasn't seen sunlight yet. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, as I said, that was the, the, the news and how it relates to fiction within this week. <laughs> yeah. I just thought it would be yeah. nice to, to mention that right off the bat, simply because it was it was almost beautifully coincidental how they were talking about 50 below zero. <gasps> That's colder than Mars! And it's like, oh, yeah. Batman's trapped and he'll walk across this, this, this you know, red to blue border, he'll go to 50 below zero. Oh no! It just seems so beautifully all, all put together. I had to mention it first and foremost. For sure, yeah. So he's, uh, but uh, as for uh, personal endeavors, what's been going on for you this week? Um, oh, well, yeah, lots of stuff. Um, I've, uh, Warcraft, World of Warcraft, I got, I started, I loaded it up again and... and Downloaded all in. the updates? Yeah, got all the updates, including the new expansion. Oh, you got um, it the 75% off deal, didn't you then? Um, well, actually, uh, my neighbor bought it for me. Oh, very nice. Just, he was feeling generous, and I guess he, he Merry wanted... Merry Christmas, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was... Uh, I logged in, and I played it, and um, I don't know if I want to stick with it. I'm not sure. Yeah, like you were talking mm-hmm. about... About how I, I was thinking about it. I just couldn't find the hope. Maybe, maybe I gotta get myself a copy of it. Uh, get myself a month or two months in there and, and try the new Pandaren race. Uh, yeah, I played the Pandaren, and um, I I don't know. Like, they seem similar to, like the the game gets very repetitive to me at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like kill this thing, kill that thing, um, <laughs> kill these things, and then again. I will admit, I find some uh, classes and races more entertaining than others. So maybe it was just a class or race combo you, you, that didn't quite work well for you. Uh, yeah, it might have been. I, I played a hunter, which I'm used to. Although, yeah, hunters have changed quite a bit since I last Oh, yeah, played. no more mana or anything like that. Uh, they don't need intelligence yeah. as, a, as a stat bonus for them. Um, I must admit, I had a lot of fun whenever I'm playing a, uh, a spellcaster. The concept of, of shooting out uh, ice bolts... Or melting people's faces is fun. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I'm the DPS spellcaster most of the time, and I know you have to wait long times for some of the the raids and whatnot to to get in. But it's I, I like it. It's fun, and sometimes you know what? On on my mage, I I do I miss the characters I had. That's what I really miss. Maybe I need to get back on my characters because mm-hmm. I miss my my undead mage. I remember being in one instance where something went wrong. Tank goes down. Everyone's going down slowly, but you know what? I'm a frost mage, and you know I take these one guys out. I'm freezing people, and I'm teleporting away, turning around, and blasting them around. Hmm. I mage tanked. I did not die. <laughs> I survived that. It wasn't a boss encounter. It was just a trash mob. Yeah. But the the sense of satisfaction of being able to okay freeze him in there, and then when he's frozen, I put down the big you know blast the AOE stuff, and that way even when he breaks out from the damage, he winds up being so slow that by the time he gets to me again, I'm able to do another you know ring of frost to freeze him, teleport back out, and go back the way I came, <laughs> and then you know I'm just I'm just mage tanking it, <laughs> and so it's stuff like that that get me in, and I I do think about that from time to time. It's like maybe that's what I need to do to get back in. Maybe I don't want to play from levels 1 to 20. Maybe I want yeah. to play my characters again. I kind of miss my goblin. She was fun. She was just a rogue, but I had more fun on the battlegrounds with her than I've ever had with any of my other characters. Something about being yeah. able to just, you know, like hide from sight and get away from trouble when things aren't going your way. It makes the battleground a little bit easier for me. A goblin rogue? Yes, yeah. just just uh, vanishing and then just you know sneaking <laughs> away while everyone else is dying. Because oh no, the uh, the alliance had a big rush on this point. <laughs> I'm just gonna go find another area to be myself in and maybe backstab somebody. Mm-hmm. So you know, like I said, it might just be a classic combo for you. Uh, you went with the Pandaren hunter. Yes. I yep. hear there's some fun to be done with that brewmaster class that they put in. 
It's uh, the new one they brought in with the Pandaren. Uh, diff- each of uh, oh. the different trees allow you for healer, tank, or DPS. So you can really be any which uh, two of any which three roles you want to be. Okay, so is the brew monster, uh, brewmaster, a, a path for the monk or something? Or? Um, oh, that's right. I think they, have, they properly changed it to monk. Brewmaster was a, its a working title back for the beta. Oh, okay, so Sorry. that's what monk is. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I think brewmaster might now be the name for the tank tree. I'll have to double check that. But that, that was its working title as it was there, because you know people kept saying, "Listen, you know the the one Pandaren guy you had there, he was a brewmaster. You gotta have the name in there somewhere." So that's what they had the class, at least for some of the uh, way way old builds now. Yeah, because because I'm I am completely out of the loop on the whole thing. So maybe yeah, maybe a monk would have been a little bit uh, more better for you. I guess maybe yeah, might have been more like yeah, new. I guess yeah. Um, although I mean I, I like being a hunter and I like having guns and explosions and <laughs> it is fun especially when you get your pet working right and you can just really deal some nice damage and yeah. the fact that you don't need bullets anymore in the game I means just go nuts man go nuts yeah and i but i miss that a little bit because um i i have some characters that i logged into and they're, they're <laughs> like oh he still has a quiver full of bullets <laughs> but the bullets do nothing now so they're trash yeah, you know. yeah. but uh I'm still waiting for what I want to be the ultimate uh, style uh, for for the hunter weapon, which is is a I'm picturing a Gatling gun, low DPS but a super super good speed on there. Mm-hmm. So instead of just bang, bang, bang for speed, it's more like a yeah. <laughs> just have a lot of fun with it. But yeah. I haven't seen anything for weapon speeds get really low, even with haste based builds. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it would be fun. <laughs> the yeah. game started off as sort of, you know, the whole medieval. Well, su- it was always you know, pseudo medieval because I mean, they did have bombs and you know, like, goblin sappers and yeah, and, the guns and weird and things and zeppelins and all that sort of stuff. But sort of the idea with guns is that they're supposed to be a little bit not perfected or a little bit shaky or you know, like. Uh, well, that's why I mean, you bring it in from some other race. Um, they had. Um, Oh, what was it? Those those ethereal guys. They never had a real body. They had to wrap themselves up in bandages. Back from the the Burning Crusade area. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the ethereals and all that. And uh, yeah, I just say, well, they they're in touch with a thousand worlds. Uh, in one of those worlds, they invented the Tommy gun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a quest reward. Have a blast with it, baby. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, I'm still waiting for that. So yeah, maybe maybe for me, that's what I need to do is actually update the game, get the latest expansion, and play my characters again. I miss my characters. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Um, could be, that, yeah, the characters. I mean, the, I guess that's one of the strengths of Warcraft is that it is a role-playing game, so you you get into a role and you play your character um, and you're interested in them as a per, like as if they were a real person, sort of. Yeah. Well, my warrior was a grim, you know, fearsome man willing to go to dark ends. Yeah. My uh, my uh, my spellcaster, my my mage, and all that. He just cared about you know just just exercising magic in any which way. My goblin was sneaky. My priest, I had a laugh emote, so he'd be melting faces as he laughed. <laughs> yeah. It's just how you play them that makes them different. Uh, I kind of miss my Death Knight, too. Although I think they've nerfed them a little bit even more now, so I don't know. But I do like him. He looks nice. I still have the original set of armor, so I can do the uh, transmutational, uh, transmogrification, so whatever gear he gets, he can look like the original Death Knight. Right. And so, you know, maybe that's what I need to do. One other thing that I that I well not that I did but that I watched so it's a simulation uh-huh. I sort of took part in but I watched uh, the new Community uh, the TV series ah, I am still so very far behind on that uh, yeah well they just started season five now oh only four and a half um, seasons behind <laughs> well that's that's fine it's um, just watch it when you can because it's I think it's very fun it's a good show that's what everyone's been saying I yeah. just I have so many things to do. Um, yeah, it, well, the episodes are 22 minutes or whatever, uh, plus commercials if you get it in a commercial format, or if not, then, yeah, they're not too long. Still, so even a half hour is something I should be able to spare once or twice a week. I, yeah, I would think. Um, but, I mean, if you don't feel like it, that's fine, too. Um, 
it's it's uh i don't know it's not essential viewing i guess i'd say it's just fun it's just good old good old tv television but it's like really. But good it's just good TV, yeah. not as opposed to sometimes I'll turn on the, the the cable basic package I have, and I'm looking like that's 20 channels I have no interest in watching, and all well, there's news, and oh hey they still have the fireplace channel I'll go to that, and so I, instead of you know like watching the many channels I do have, I wind up watching a fake fireplace on TV. So this is better than a fireplace, right? <laughs> it's better than a fireplace. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so I guess I yeah I won't spoil anything and I guess I mean the it's there's not a lot to do with the plot it's just it's just a funny show like I don't it's nice don't seeing everyone back again because you know there's yeah. word that they might not come back after season three and then four yeah well like a lot of shows it's just sort of like every time it sort of hangs in the balance managing to eke out season <laughs> after season yeah. Um, and it is a little weird because most colleges, like it's set in a community college, right? Yeah. And community college, most programs, or like the big programs, I guess, are four years. So after they've been in it for four years, they graduated at the end of last season. And so here they are, they're back at the school again for some reason. Um, and instead of a study group, which is the reason that they, they had the, the core, you know, yeah. the, the cast. Yeah, how they had the together. dynamic initially. Yeah. Uh, instead of a study group, now it's a student-teacher alliance because one of the characters became a teacher. Ah, that's and, a good way to keep them at the school. Uh, yeah, so it's because they have a riot and they have, like, the students are uh, demanding higher grades or something like that. And Yeah, so... Okay, um, we'll start a new class. Everyone gets super A's. They don't <laughs> mean anything, but you got a better grade. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so they have... That's what the... I think that's what they're... The, the reason that they meet and hang out is because they're doing uh, a, a, an alliance to try and work out student-teacher issues, which sounds, that doesn't sound as, well, no, a study group, yeah, which is more interesting or boring? Study group, student-teacher <laughs> alliance, or fireplace? <laughs> I don't know. But I suppose, I mean, yeah, that's the thing about TV. It's not about what the setting is, it's about what you do with it. Because that show, I mean, it's just so imaginative. Well, I mean, look at Cheers. You describe it as yeah. a bunch of people going, yeah. uh, a bunch of regular bar patrons going yeah, to their in a, bar. Yeah, a bar, yeah. And Seinfeld about literally nothing. Yeah, but they were charismatic nothings. I miss George, still. Char- well, they're uncharismatic, charismatic. <laughs> like, they're... It's they're <laughs> deliciously flawed caricatures of people. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I would say George is charismatic, but he's, he's Jason funny Alexander is charismatic, yeah. and that's why people like George, even uh, if yeah. he's just a potatoey, angry lump of a man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so I think I've talked about all the things that I uh. did and saw. Uh, how about you? Uh, what did you? What did you? Well, simulate. Uh, I made a New Year's resolution. I actually made a couple, but the one that pertains is I yeah. want to try and get more reading in. I have got a lot of things to read around here. I've read a lot, but I still have even more. Did you put a number on it, or just kind of vague more reading? Well, I do want to try and make up more of a habit of reading, you know, sort of thing. Okay, like so much per week, an hour per week, or? Um, I'm just going to try easing into it and see if I can. I can just naturally ramp it up. The more I read, the more I tend to want to read. Okay. So if I keep making a point of forcing myself to start, then I'll keep going naturally. Well, if you read one big book in January, then you won't have to read anything for the rest of the year. Uh, I don't have to, but, uh, well, I'll level with you. I haven't gotten done all the reading of the stuff I got on the silent auction from last year's Gotacon. Okay. Yeah, and get so, get through that. conceptually, if I, well, you know, I, some stuff is understandable, like the Choose Your Own Adventures. You go through a few times, but you don't want to try and hunt down every last possible, you know, contingency. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, it's like I might wind up feeling a little guilty if I, you know, put my my name and price down on something. And it's like, well, I, mean, I haven't even finished reading this stuff from last year, and I want to bid more because that was a lot of fun. I, I want to yeah. be part of that silent auction again. And you have slightly more disposable income this year, but well, not a lot Debatable. more. Debatable. <laughs> um, we'll say my visa bills are less now than they were last year. Yeah, there you go. At this time, so yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and I'm making good tips at work sometimes. Hooray. Yeah, yeah. But I might wind up spending that all on WoW to get back into the game a little bit. So. Oh, yes. I gotta try. I gotta get my heart back in there. I, I do miss it. Or at least give, I give at least give it a try. So maybe, maybe, maybe the the whole Pandaria thing is for me. I just haven't experienced it yet. I'll have to find out. Yeah, and well, and the other thing is like I haven't even started on the the ninety level what eighty five to ninety. Yeah, so yeah, that fun. Well, I've been told be I've been told they've uh, they're doing real good at balancing, so it doesn't feel like a chore hitting those last five levels. Yeah, and that's well, a, yeah. I, I don't know how that works. I mean, that, that's its own puzzle because um, it should be a little bit of a chore, I always thought, because it's, it's, you're supposed to feel like you accomplished well, something. Well, if, if you, fin- if you go through the storylines that they have in the areas, mm-hmm. then you'll find yourself, it's like, oh, you know, I'm at level, you know, one uh, level away sort of thing. All I have to do is just start going through some of the, the dungeons and then I'll be good enough to, to get ready for the heroics already. Yeah. And I always fe- I felt like the last ex- ever since Cataclysm I felt like it almost goes by without being noticed. A lot of people complained with with uh, Cataclysm uh, as uh, as being a little too easy, uh, but disjointed. Like you got to go over here, you got to go over here, you got to go over here, and so you're, yeah. you're down into the water now. You're in a desert sort of thing. Um, so hopefully they've refined it to one particular thematic thing as opposed to just all over the map. Although I still think all over the map helps gives you a nice variety to see what's been happening from the whole, you know, cataclysm. Yeah, you get to explore the region. Yeah. Um, but uh, I remember the Burning Crusade, there were people just saying, oh, I have to keep grinding to make this level. Yeah. I need to make it so I can get going, so I can go to the dungeon, so I can go to the better dungeon, so I can go to the best dungeons. Uh, you know, mm. in my mind I was thinking, dude, if that's what you're in here for, you're doing this wrong. I was in yeah. the spots to play for fun. I was doing that. I tried making uh, one of those uh, Hala raids in, in the Grand at level 62. And so I was basically just running from the monsters to say nothing of doing anything to help my fellow man. <laughs> I was just trying to not die. Yeah. And that was kind of fun. And so long as I'm having fun, my time's not wasted. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But uh, yes, uh, this week I managed to to get back into the Conan stories. My wife uh, got me for Christmas last year, uh-huh. and there are some big stories. And I, you know, I, every time I do read Conan stories, it strikes me how different uh, it's written as opposed to to these days. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can't say it was written better back then. I can't say it was written worse. I can't say it was just. It seemed a little less like the person had watched a lot of TV or a lot of uh, you know seen a lot of movies. It, it seemed much more pure in its own sense of mind. More literary, I guess? Yes, as though he had read a lot more works and he wasn't like, okay, now how does this play out on the big screen? Mm. And so that when, you know, because when a person's like writing something today, they might be seeing it as like they're watching a movie in their own head. Yeah, yeah. Whereas back then, no, it was, you know, it was very much more of from a literary basis. Things were described a bit here and there, but it didn't say like, oh, the Shemite archers with their this sort of thing and then describe every little feature about them as you see how badass they are. It's like, no, mm-hmm. they're archers, they're bearded, they're Shemites. There you go. They're the sons of Shem and they got bow and arrow. And that's what they're okay. doing. Bam. That's all you need to know. Fill in the rest yourself, buddy. And, uh, and yeah, I really did like it. I haven't finished the full story, but uh, uh, Conan got knocked out. Uh, the guy had a ring with a purple lotus on there, and he comes up and smacks him. Conan's chopping people left, right. There's like a like, like mound of bodies around him. He's the last of his 5,000 troops. He's yeah. the king of Aquilonia at this time. And uh, the evil sorcerer has got a ring that, as he moves with uh, unnatural speed, comes up, knocks him, and paralyzes him. So Conan gets you know knocked down and paralyzed as he gets dragged into a, an enemy city sort of thing. Oh, yeah. And that was just the first chapter. <laughs> So I was like, whoa, man, this is, the pace is also, like, a lot different. Like, this would probably have been, like, maybe, like, two-thirds of a book if it was written nowadays. It would have been stretched out. So the whole compression mm. of, on it, I find, is also really nice. Okay, so you I'm, like that. I might want to consider doing that myself when I'm writing. Is, uh, don't worry about every little thing, everything. Sometimes, yeah, you can have it skip ahead with a decent pace. Uh, you don't need to, to make it last two-thirds of a book. It was a single chapter. That's all it needed to be. Hmm. It sets up the plot, really, so... Yeah, yeah, sure. 
Uh, the plot being, he interacts with evil sorcerers, and I'm willing to bet someone loses their head by the end of the story, and it's not going to be Conan. Yeah. That's all. That, that's my prediction. But, uh, so yeah, so I'm trying to get back into the reading and all that, and uh, that was my big thing, is spending more time reading. Um, well, that's good. <laughs> well, actually, I did a lot of reading elsewhere, but that uh, would wind up bringing us to our t- main topic for the day. Okay, well, uh, yeah, are you done uh uh, talking about your your week, yeah, I'll <laughs> seg into it that way then, uh, because okay. I spent a lot of time this week reading about doppelgangers. Uh, um, yes. On the one hand, I love them; they're an excellent monster. On the other hand, I despise them; they are a poorly done monster. Mm, so, doppelgangers, bad monster or good monster? They're both. Um, for the purpose of their role, what they're supposed to do and accomplish, they are great monsters. They're excellent. They're supposed to imitate a person take their stuff, live their lives, yep. cause fear, paranoia, and, and uh, cause all sorts of issues. The heroes are supposed to stop them. Hey, save the day at the end. And they do this admirably. They can read minds. They can change their shape. They don't need a lot more other than that. They're not really big on combat because they're sneaky kind of monsters, but they don't have anything weird like, you know, like, uh, oh, and then it uh, turns into a gaseous fog like a vampire does and floats away. Yeah. So they actually got to keep thinking. Unless it's a vampire doppelganger. But that might be a topic for another day. Um, So I like them in that perspective. On the other hand, where do they come from? Why are they doing what they're doing? There is no backstory, no motivation, no impetus for them to be these life-stealing jerks. Okay. Aside from the fact that they can. You mean not in the core rules, because people have written... People have have written stuff here and there, and I've, I've been looking. I, I looked around, I looked at the previous uh, editions, I looked at 4th edition. Yeah. Uh, some of the, the look ahead towards the 5th edition stuff about doppelgangers. Um, and they all pointed the same way. They sow distrust and paranoia just by being there. Even if they're being out in the open, no one can truly be themselves around a doppelganger. They're always afraid of losing, you know, their lives to the doppelgangers. The doppelganger takes them. Mm, okay. Um, Keith Baker, the uh, the man who did the Eberron setting, had uh, the complete guide to doppelgangers, and he wrote stuff about them. Like they have different life stages and different bits. So he effectively includes the mimic uh, and uh, some of the greater mimics from the older editions right. into different life uh, stages of doppelgangers. As they huh. go uh, throughout, and they try and all get, like, get a group together and form like a, a communal budding pod thing, and that's how they breed. I they see. hit some sort of amalgamated gestalt mass and then butt off n- new doppelgangers. Yeah, and that's what their society is all about: is trying to get to the stage and keeping the stage safe as long as possible. And I can dig that, but it's still not a lot to go on. And so while I like the doppelganger, I can respect them because of what they do within the game, what their role is. Yeah. I despise them because of their lack of motivation. So so uh, have you spent much time thinking about doppelgangers? <laughs> I guess not not a lot, no. Um, and in some ways I just see them... I don't know. I, I've never really wanted to use them as a DM. I, I mean... I like that they're available if I needed, like, you know, a they're clearly, super spy. Yeah. They're clearly not, like, a combat thing. Like, uh, yeah. It's like, oh, i got to throw something nasty at them to fight. Um, demonic cows, sure, yeah, yeah well, it's attacked by demon cows, that's all I need. Yeah. No, they're, they're, not, they're not combat heavy, they're very much more subterfuge. They're nice for more role-playing-esque, more urban settings. Yeah, and and that's the thing. Like, if you throw like a bad guy at the at the party, and like it turns into a doppelganger at the end, or like you know they think they're fighting just some guy or some the mayor's become something. corrupted and horrible. We must fight yeah. him. Oh no, it was a doppelganger. And then it's like, oh well, I guess it was a doppelganger. It's, it's it seems kind of a letdown at the end to be. It, it doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't pay off. But I mean, you can you can craft a story where the it makes. Uh, it will close off loops or whatever. It makes sense that there's a doppelganger, but also you know the the whole world of D and D, you all you also have wizards and masters of disguise, and you know m- even a high level rogue can pull off a very convincing disguise. Ah, but the rogue can't always read the mind. So that's the thing is, whereas the rogue might be able to steal somebody's identity, they can't read the mind of someone asking them a question like, "How do I know you're really you know my." Uh, my twin brother. Like, I'll ask you a question only he would know. 
but you know the answer as well. Mm -hmm. So that way, when you ask the question, the doppelganger reads your mind, he's able to give the answer back. So he's able to know the things that nobody else should be able to know to make it truly seem like, yes, he's the right one after all. Whereas the twin brother, he forgot that stuff years ago, man. Mm -hmm. Let it go. And all of a sudden, everyone thinks he's a doppelganger because he got the question wrong. So the doppelganger is able to have fun with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're a good tool, but I, I keep looking at them and I keep saying, why? What is their motivation to stealing lives? What is their uh, motivation to being assassins other than that they're very well suited for that sort of life? I will become someone who they trust and then the knife goes in the back. Well, I mean, it's, that's funny because, like, why... What's the motivation for any character? Like, what's the motivation for a human? Um, so, I don't know. I guess, yeah, what... Why are you well, putting it in the with story? With the base uh, human sort of thing, uh, with their motivation, it's it's greed. And the assassin yeah. gets paid for, uh, you know, doing his job because well, he's got something to do. He wants to maintain, you know, like I've got the the suite at the penthouse of whatever tower it is in this medieval fantasy world. I want to keep living this lifestyle. I got to get some way to pay the bills. Yeah. Well, don't doppelgangers have to eat and you know? Um, well, they do, but it occurs to me, you know, it's like. Uh, why aren't they actors? Why aren't they going up on stage mm. and putting on the best freaking performance anyone ever saw and then you don't have to pay money for the costumes because the doppelganger changes into that? You could have yeah. four doppelgangers and if you have them rotate on and off stage properly enough, you could have them play like a different do uh, a dozen different characters and uh, none would be the wiser until the end when it's only the four people coming out taking the bow and the crowd goes wild that dude there was a dozen characters up on that play and it was only four people and it wasn't like they were maintaining the same mm. character back and forth they were switching like you know like Elise the, you know the, the princess leaves off stage right she comes back on stage left later but it's not the same person playing Elise it's a second doppelganger on that not the first one it's like oh wow <laughs> so they could be really consummate you know thespians they could be like the personification or well demi personification of of the art of acting you know and no no they're thieves they steal somebody's life and then they live off that until the, the life goes broke and then they go you know elsewhere kill another person take that life uh yeah well i guess maybe nobody's thought of to do a, an acting troupe of all doppelgangers i would I'd look. There might be something somewhere in a dungeon adventure, or dungeon magazine, but I've never heard of that. But that's very much playing against the type of the doppelgangers. The basic yeah. uh, concept of the doppelganger is a life stealing dick. Is is the best way I've been able to to think of it in my head. Is is they they steal your life, they kill you. Maybe after a little while, they may keep you like in in your own basement trapped, and they steal your life. Why? Because you were successful enough that they can live off the avails for a little while and they're they're parasites. Yeah, well, D&D &D is is built on stereotypes. Um and you were saying too before about um if you have a doppelganger, if you know somebody's a doppelganger like in your community, mm -hmm. you're not going to trust them. You're not going to trust anyone, but you're going to be like, "Well, no, like we can't we just can't function with somebody I can't really kind of speak about him behind his <laughs> back because I'm never certain if I'm actually speaking to him in disguise. Yeah, exactly. And, like, it could be the lawfulest, lawful good doppelganger and totally above board and super honest about everything, and still people wouldn't trust them. So, of course, that's the thing about D&D &D, is they take those stereotypes and they say, well, now this stereotype is real. Uh, but it occurs to me, though, is... Um there's just so little about them for the background, for the motivation, for the history. Mm -hmm. Like, where did they come from? They seem to be a species that cannot exist without society having pre-existed. The concept yeah, of a small maybe. town doesn't really work. Like a small, like, Hor uh, Thorpe or Hamlet, doppelganger moves in. No, everyone's working there. Um, so why doesn't the doppelganger just move in and start working the fields? Well, I suppose the doppelganger could move in and start and take over the role of the lord, the local lord. We don't um, have to work. Well, that's the thing, though. Is I mean, if the doppelganger doesn't want to be like a you know like a you know a life stealer, then why don't they just say, okay, yeah, now I'm a blonde-haired farm boy. Uh, you know, I'm, whose life am I stealing? Nobody's. But now nobody knows I'm a doppelganger. They think I'm just another human being. I'm gonna go tend to the cows and then uh, work the fields for the rest of the day. Well, that, yeah, that's interesting because doppelgangers don't feel like, and and this is sort of what you need to be a doppelganger. 
they don't have their own identity because they can assume any identity. Um, and that's sort of part of their nature. But the identities they, they, they take, are, you know, the identities they assume are stuff that they, they seem to take from others. There's no, you know, doppelgangers that go, this has been a pretty good five years, but I feel like, uh, you know, I, I just got to keep moving on. So they go to the next town, they assume a random identity, and then they just be that person for a little while. They don't, mm -hmm. like, wander around experiencing the richness of human life by taking all possible roles as they go from a situation to a situation. No, they steal a life. They take somebody's yeah. life and then they uh, usurp it. They don't make anything for themselves. They're just parasitic leeches. <laughs> well, n not even all humans take advantage of living a human life. I mean, that's the, the thing about adventurers is adventurers are supposedly rare. Well, that, <laughs> now, I recall one bit about uh, the nature of an adventure. Um, a cleric of a god of thieves and assassins asking adventurers not to pray to this deity because it's not really suited. If you take mm -hmm. somebody's uh, possessions, but not their life, then you're a thief. If you take somebody's life, but not their possessions, you're an assassin. If you take somebody's life and then their possessions, you're an adventurer. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, okay, maybe you can see adventures as being in a somewhat similar odd vein. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah I think so. But, uh, well, what, like, as, let me ask you this. Like, if you suddenly woke up tomorrow and you had the ability to um, to be to look like anyone else and to assume like other shapes would you use it like would what would you do I would definitely uh, start looking into the local acting uh, theaters and all that okay um, I know they don't pay great but you know what it's a pretty darn good skill to use <laughs> yeah. um, I mean heck if just by virtue of being able to manipulate your voice based on, on who you look like you could become you could, you could make people forget Mel Blanc. The man okay. of a thousand yeah, so voices? Be a voice actor. Yeah. I could be a million voices. I could look like the characters as I'm speaking them. Hmm. I suppose, yeah. I mean, you could, you could go on TV rather quickly if you, be, if you were a doppelganger. If you had the ability to look like anyone, just, you know, oh, now I'm George Clooney. <laughs> and the concept of, of D20 Modern, where they bring in the monsters and they show, like, a monster, a, you know, in, in a modern-day setting, like a, an illithid priest... Or the, yeah. I think it was a bugbear, uh, like a hockey enforcer. Oh, yeah. It's kind of fun stuff there. Um, but the concept of a doppelganger as being the highest paid celebrity in Hollywood. There. There, man. I mean, dude, Batman uh, has had at least a couple villains become a clay face because, you know, oh, you know, I, I'm so good at changing how I look. The concept of that as a doppelganger, you know, is a, I have no real face of my own. I just add them up to make it up. Yeah. At least they could try something like that, but it just seems that they're parasitic and that they, the fact that they seem to need a society, a civilization, before they can properly exist. I can see orcs being uncultured savages, you know, basically a Neanderthal type thing. I can see them in crude, you know, like orc towns and what you see in most D&D settings. Mm -hmm. I can see them becoming refined to being, you know, the, the orcish empire, something like a Klingon type empire. I can see them at all levels of civilization. Mm -hmm. I can't picture doppelgangers, you know, as like a like a hunter gatherer tribe. What what do they do? Oh yeah. Well, they could. I suppose they could sneak up on like deer and stuff by pretending to be another deer. Ah, but that's the thing. They can only assume humanoid forms, okay. smaller, or medium. So maybe they could just. Oh, look at me! I'm an innocent halfling or elf. I'm at one with nature. <coughs> Stab! Now you're dead. I gotcha. Well, they could they could infiltrate other tribes or like you know. But that's like the thing is is they they have to rely on other things. They are yeah. by, now, don't get me wrong. I am a biologist by by training, so I do know that there are parasitic creatures out there. There are yeah. birds that will you know find a, another species nest, chuck the eggs out down to the ground. Oh, splatter! Now they're dead. Lay their own eggs and force the the birds of the nest to you know raise their young instead of the the proper children of the nest. Yeah. And so that's an actual thing. But it's not quite the same with doppelgangers, because what you see with the birds is more like the changeling uh, stuff you, you see in, in folklore, where they steal your human baby and replace it with a changeling one, and they take your, your little mortal baby off to the realms of fairies and whatever it is they got over there. Yeah. I well, don't know what they want with human <laughs> babies, but whatever. Um, 
I mean, humans have lived in in social groups ever since we've been humans, and even since before we were human. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Apparently our primate ancestors were very social, too. So I can imagine a doppelganger elo- evolving parallel to, you know, the hominids or the even, you know, there could be doppel apes, doppelganger <laughs> apes. Um, who well, that, that is what uh, Heath Baker wound up doing, something similar yeah. like that, as they, they had a degenerate, uh, like a dungeon doppelgangers that only assumed ooze forms, the rural ones that assumed stuff like rocks or trees, mm-hmm. and then the uh, the urban stuff, you know, in the deep city core that assumed human form. Yeah, and I guess it's not really defined in the rules, like whether the, this whole like supernatural property of shape changing, like does it extend all the way to, you know, amorphous, like does shape changing as a, I don't know, as a concept, does it include everything like changing into animals or changing into oozes or is it that doppelgangers have a limited shape changing because the nature of shape changing only applies like in a limited way it's just well i think for doppelgangers they limit it to small and medium humanoids because the concept like oh no i've been discovered and then it turns into a bird and flies away you can't give chase it's flown away you can't can you fly no then you lose well i think it prevented that sort of thing yeah i can or turn into gaseous form or something like that. That's yeah. An even further step. Stupid vampire abilities. Um, but yeah, if we're talking about evolution, though, it's t- we're talking about like uh, these creatures are related to these other creatures. So like, but so there's a shape changer that get, that has more a variety of things it can turn into. Is it related to the? But that opens up a whole other kettle of fish, so so to speak, because uh, because if you put evolution in the game, you get into all sorts of weird issues. Yeah, yeah true. You know, it might be best just to assume, you know what, this is a place where you could throw a fireball around, so maybe evolution doesn't happen. You just get changed by the gods. Well, uh, I, yeah, I, I guess I don't. you don't have to even think about it, really. I mean, but I sort of like to imagine that sort of, that evolution works even in the D&D world. Just, we just don't know how. Well, magic evolution sort of thing. Yeah, I, sure. I think... I think they did uh, something very, very well in the uh, the Burning Crusade of WoW. Okay. With uh, when uh, you know Draenor gets uh, effectively blown up from trying to open too many portals, and uh, and everyone's uh, you know goes oh no what's happening and there's magic rifts shifting through the land the creatures changed, yeah it became like a mutational catalyst for them and so the what was ordinarily like um, some sort of jungle cat or I guess uh, you know like a, like a lynx or some sort of creature like that becomes the phase creatures you encounter all throughout the place. And so yeah. I, that works, and I think as long as somebody was to maintain that sort of thing as their equivalent to evolution, yeah, okay, I can dig that. Yeah, well, and the, the evolution is pretty powerful. Like it can, it, it can change like creatures from very small to very large. It can, you know, add things, take like you know, add. Like, oh, yeah, and I, <laughs> don't get me wrong, I, I do like doing that too. Is uh, in um, island-based campaigns, I'm going to have more small creatures than medium, mm-hmm. because. Well, why? It seems right. Why does it seem right? Because you have less pressure put on you when you're a smaller creature, and so creatures on islands uh, tend to be naturally smaller because you can have more of them then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, although it doesn't really explain King... <laughs> although it doesn't really explain King Kong, who has his own island, and he was, like, super big. Hmm... Uh, actually, that's one of the movies I saw this last week was King Kong Escapes, and he goes from oh, yeah. island to island. Uh, I guess it's just north of uh, uh, New Zealand area is okay. where he's at. And so, yeah, he uh, he goes from island to island. He's not just Skull Island. Sometimes it's Mondo Island and such and so forth. But, you know, whatever. He's a giant ape, and you don't need any reason for a giant ape story. Oh, uh, yeah. But let me pose something here to you there. Uh, what if I came up with a few ideas for, for like backgrounds for doppelgangers, and we can rate them and see what might work, what might not work? Okay, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So, doppelgangers are what the gods used to create all the humanoid life forms that they have. Why are there so many humanoid life forms? They had a proto-template, a generic mm-hmm. humanoid form that the gods were able to turn into what they wanted. Morden made his dwarves, uh, whatever his face is, Coralon made, you know, the elves, and somebody, nobody knows who made the humans. And, you know, and all the races were made, you know, the orcs and the goblins, and they were all made up and from small to medium and all that. Um, and then we can split this off into two ways. Either uh, there were some leftovers that just never got used, 
a god got sundered and his portion of the proto-humans were never used, and that's what doppelgangers are. Or some did not want to become. Some wanted to remain not, you know, uh, like defined. They wanted to maintain their ability to keep going and keep being everything. Mm-hmm. And so they, they uh, you know, escaped. And so they're always, you know, like uh, hiding now and amongst uh, the gods' peoples. Mm-hmm. Trying to see if there's some way that they can get, you know, the humans, the elves, the dwarves, the orcs, the goblins to get back to their primal doppelganger state. Okay. Would that work? Is you know for for that is, is why are they they stealing lives? Is because they're studying people. They're always trying to figure out if there's a way to get back. Uh, that works as like I don't know as something they might believe. I don't know if that should be the the truth though. Well, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. It doesn't quite seem like my ideal okay. you know, origin. All right. No, I had, I had one uh, idea here. Just figure this one out here. Okay. Somewhere in the corner of the multiverse, there exists the prophesied people that never came to be. The warlord, the king, the tyrant, whatever, you know, that was prophesied, you know, they still have to exist. Even if the you know the mighty adventures change the course, and, and so that uh, you know the warlord never becomes the warlord, he stays the you know inept town you know guard buffoon sort of figure. He never okay. realizes his potential. He never becomes why? Because the heroes made him look like an idiot instead of letting him naturally rise to power and assuming greater roles and becoming the conqueror of nations. Why did the heroes manage to make him look like a fool? Because someone prophesied he would become this this horrible warlord. And so if the heroes change it so that he never becomes the warlord, what did the guy prophesy? What did he see in his his future prophecies? And so to prevent a paradox, these figures have to exist somewhere. And so they're kept in a little private domain. Never are properly allowed to leave, but yet they must remain for the remainder of what would be their natural lives. So the prophecy may actually, you know, be done, and, and you know, and paradox doesn't unravel the universe. Okay. Now, they're stuck there, you know, in this uh, little bubble world, but they're still mortal, and they still have mortal urges. Now, what happens to, uh, you know, uh, two people when they're close together and they got some time and they're compatible? <gasps> Relations happen. Okay. What happens when two people who never existed, have a child. What does that child look like? Nothing, because it doesn't exist. And that's where the doppelgangers come from. (laughs) They are the uh, unexpected progeny of two people who never existed. Oh, okay. Or never came into (laughs) being. That's interesting, yeah. Okay. And so that way, you know, maybe they don't have anything grander in their life aside from being like a cosmic quirk of, of reality. Yeah. But at least they're there. They have a history it explains, you know, why they they look like nothing and everything. Yeah. They are quantumly undefined or something. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, I suppose you could always work with your your storytellers about, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, magical transmutations gone wrong. Not bad. Not great, but not bad, I suppose. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, someone, you know, in a wild magic zone casts um, mass polymorph and things go weird and all of a sudden everybody stops looking like ever, anybody at all. And that's how you get like the first tribe of doppelgangers, freaked out as to what they are, and they can't get their way back because, uh, you know, the wizard who cast it blew up. It's a wild magic zone. It happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, they try and integrate themselves into society as best as their abilities see fit, and thus they become, you know, like the like the the life stealing things. They don't. They can't remember what it is like to be the people that they were. So they they take a life and they re- assume it, and then you know they kill off the rest of the family and fill it with their other doppelgangers and they have their little doppelganger people there trying to remember what it was like to be people. And that follows on through the generations. All doppelgangers sense that there's something not quite right with them. They're supposed to belong with the people around them, but they don't know how to do that right. And that explains why they're doing what they're doing. It's like some sort of racial trait of them Mm -hmm. trying to fit back in. And it's all just a magical, you know, hiccup. Yeah, it's like a magical version of um, disassociative de- identity disorder. Exactly, and, and so that yeah. yeah, and that way it winds up becoming like a, not so much that they're you know because like, they're supposed to be neutral. 
mm-hmm. but the way most people would wind up putting them in a situation, they're evil because they're killing someone to take their life and then their possessions, you know, and uh, assume that. Mm-hmm. This way, they seem much more like a tragic figure. Yeah. Yeah. Constantly doing the wrong thing, but never, you know, uh, psychologically aware enough to realize all the harm they're doing as they carry out these base impulses. Yeah. So I think that's not a bad one. It's not grand, but it's it's at least a feasible ex- explanation. It's technically more of an explanation than uh, owl bears have ever gotten, and everyone seems fine with that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, how about how about something more poetic and eloquent? Let's go back to the the concept of the uh, the uh, the actors. And all that. What if, what if there was an actor who was so good and could become so anybody so well, eventually he or she sloughed off their entire actual mortal identity? What if they were so good at becoming everyone, they fooled even the gods in reality itself and became the first doppelganger? Even mm. reality couldn't remember who exactly they were, or what they looked like. Even the person themselves couldn't, and then thus the, they weren't. It's poetic. I don't. Yeah. Uh, it might be a nice, uh, you know, doppelganger, you know, around the campfire story to tell. I don't know how well it works, but I think it has a nice poetic, like, a mythological sense to it. Yeah, yeah. You could see that being told next to a story of something that Hercules does while he's drunk. <laughs> or we work with uh, one final one for you. Um, they do have the uh, the demi plane of mirrors, and you know, you know, you can go from mm-hmm. one mirror to another. What's on the other side of the mirror? Doppelgangers. What do they do whenever you're looking into the mirror? They mimic you. They look back. That's what they're supposed to do. They are your reflection. Hmm. I like this and, one. And it's when they get out of uh, into the real world, or you know, into the prime material plane, things start going really weird because there's not yeah. that plain <laughs> bo- boundary on there, and so they, they get all messed up. They get confused, and uh, I got to be someone. Got to be someone. I can't just be everyone in front of me because then nobody, bo- you know, is acting right. Everyone's uh, panicking. I got to be just this one person, and so that's why they would take that one life. If they're a planner, wayward, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, like mimic sort of thing. Yeah, they're not supposed to be on this plane of existence, and that's why things aren't right with them. Yeah, I kind of like that one. And it does give you a chance to to bring in the, the the plane of mirrors, which is kind of fun from a visual perspective, at least in the players' minds. Yeah. Well, yeah, I like that. But I I I want to think that maybe there's something a little more elemental, like a mirror elemental, um, that lives in the mirror, and then something has to happen to that, because you know mirrors would have, because um, they're fairly neutral and they they're harmless too, hmm. and then something would have to act on that creature or that not even cre- but a spirit or you know the spirit that lives in the mirror or whatever or some sort of just really messed up summoning spell like yeah that. something has to change them and alter them and give them a more corporeal existence because obviously uh, mm. doppelgangers are corporeal so they become part of our world and in so doing they 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 actually gain a little bit of identity because doppelgangers when they enter into the world they they do take on their own like isness or <laughs> whatever they okay well, well they here's, here's one I, I was able to cobble up quickly in my head yeah, yeah. okay uh, wizard is uh, making constructs we'll say it's a nice gnomish wizard he, that's his big thing he makes magical constructs yeah. but he's tired with the basics he's tired of iron he's tired of uh, stone he's tired of flesh very tired of flesh that stuff rots <laughs> and so he wants to create a new elemental and he tries uh, a new uh, new golem and with a you know to bind up with the elemental because that's how it is. They're bound elementals in there. Yeah. And so he tries to create the quicksilver golem. Yeah, yeah. And so the quicksilver, which is you know like uh, effectively mercury in, in our day and age, it would be liquid and ephemeral and, and changing. And so as he tries to you know like in you know magically make the the thing, he summons the wrong elemental. He summons the mirror elemental. Mm-hmm. And so that's what creates the first doppelganger. It was supposed to be an artificial construct, but it became too alive. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the alive point can happen sometime later on down the road, do like a Pinocchio sort of thing. Now I'm <laughs> a real boy. <laughs> and that's how they became and came into existence. Yeah. Now I guess the what the do doppelgangers breed true? Now uh they do breed true and uh, I believe in some cases breeding with a human still breeds them true. As Another with most things, okay. yeah, as with uh, like Medusas and uh, Minotaurs um, right. in most editions, they breed true against humanity. 
Um, except for the Eberron campaign setting where they will eventually produce changelings. Yeah, yeah, there's that. There's um which is I, I kind of I I'm not sure how much I like changelings. I, I haven't ever played one, so I guess I don't know about that. I do like the concept of having uh you know, like people have tried to play doppelgangers before and Keith Baker says, Hey, what if we strip the powers down to a little bit more of a reasonable level? Something so that, you know, oh hey, a person can play them around first level. Yeah. You could take some feats to add in extra stuff and become, you know, better at shape changing and doing other stuff. You could work it that way. And so I think he did something really good that way, you know, because I think it's, I think it's a much more uh, a balanced perspective, because as it is, the doppelganger themselves are supposed to be like uh, plus, it's, it's a four hit die, plus four, so it's effectively equivalent to an eighth level character. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty powerful as things go. That's almost you know powerful enough to uh, to get you legend lord. And I figure if you can be Legend Lord, you must be Legendary, so, well, that makes you nearly Legendary. Yeah, okay. Um, which kind of blows their whole thing as to what they're doing. If you can say, oh, just Legend Lord, figure out what they're doing. Oh, okay, it's, it's this guy, get him out of there. He's not really him, he's a doppelganger, trust me. So, uh, so, uh, do the doppelgangers seem better if they have a history behind them then? If you were to pick uh, any one of those histories out that, you know, that I presented up for the origin of doppelgangers... Do they seem like a more worthwhile uh, like foe in that they're not just a scenario that you set up? They have like a motivation and that's more, I guess, I mean, organic or reactionary, pro-actionary? Uh, possibly. Um, because I don't know if I want to... Like, if you make them that... Um, if you give them all that detail and, and, and that sort of thing, you're almost asking for the campaign to feature them somehow. Or... Let's have some fun with it. They claim all the story, uh, all the storylines I just uh, dropped in there yeah. as their own, and thus they take them as they change their perspectives and their their personas. Yeah, there you go. Which fits with a doppelganger <laughs> fairly well. Yeah, a little hokey, but I think uh, you know uh, at least crack a smile for some people. Um, yeah. Uh, well, and that's the thing. Like, what if you have a doppelganger in your game? Do you want to focus on it, their story and their background? Well, I just think having a story and a background yeah. provides so much more. Because there was a time Alithids were just a creature that sucked your brain out. Oh, yeah, I ha that was a Lovecraft <laughs> reference. I get that. Nice. Okay, so I yeah. kill it and go on to the next room. Um, and that's basically what they were. And then the Spelljammer setting came out. And what were the Alithids? These were the, some nasty creatures. They had their own world, and they, they suddenly grew more. They were became more than just a monster. Mm -hmm. They became a force to be reckoned with. And now you look at them, they're from the future. In the future of the D&D &D cosmology, everything gets taken over by the, uh, the, uh, the, the Lithid Empire. Mm -hmm. The whole thing happens like that. Everything becomes uh, you know, Lithid controlled, but it's the end of the universe and everything's starting to, c to collapse. So they send themselves back in time to hmm. take it all over again. Yeah. Of course they're going to win. They've been to the future. They've already won. Hmm. At least that's how they present it in the, uh, the, uh, the Splat book in 3.5. Yep, yep, for sure. And I think that's decently well done. And so, you know, just having a, a thing behind them you know, like a history, you know, just, just uh, like a, a model for them to, to say, this is my motivation, this is why I'm doing what I do, yeah. makes them more. Um, it turns, a, you know, like a dragon from a, just a gold hoarding beast into a force of nature, you know, that, that owns the forest upon which it lives. It it does more to it than, than elevated above the stats. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you want that, you want it to be embedded in the campaign. And, and of course, I guess it's, it's a different problem when we're talking about actually getting this information across to the PCs because it, sometimes they're uncurious and mm -hmm. sometimes they, there shouldn't be a way for them to find out. Like, th these are secret historic histories or you don't know which history is correct. I suppose there might be spells that could uh, unravel. which Divinations and torture, whichever <laughs> your character alignment yeah. allows. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's its own issue, like how to get this information out to the PCs in a way that's not like, you know, hitting them with a history book or, you know. Well, I, I just think having it in a, a single campaign setting could be all that, that really tips the balance from them being 
a monster people recognize but don't always use into yeah. a monstrous race like the doppelgangers or the neo guy or all sorts of other things that you know that that are seen as more than i mean fiends and, you know and devils and all that they could just be monsters but they took the time to devote the blood war and yeah. the planner conflicts and thus they became something so much more something uh, so much more powerful and central to the theme for a while it seemed for the nine hells that they were effectively ousting the gods the gods were just oh yeah they're powerful but they're off to the side they're not the real important part of the planes yeah we're if you're in the nine hells you're with us yeah yeah set he's just that crazy god off on like the third layer building an eternally bigger pyramid no one pays attention to him he's not important and so because that they had the story to work around they became more important than the gods themselves yeah, and that's worth like like thinking as a concept. You know, you with the right backstory, you can become very potent within a campaign, even if you know you're not that big or even featured prominently. Well, it's important though, in order to become like a mover and shaker in a campaign world, often you need a society. Like the Illithids have an empire or whatever, and the the demons and devils have lots of them working sort of together, roughly together. I don't know about the demons so much. But the the thing about doppelgangers is there's no doppelganger empire. I suppose you could have you know a campaign world in which there was a doppelganger empire. But what if, yeah, there was an entire city that was just entirely <laughs> doppelgangers, all masquerading as people. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but you um, so yeah, you cast a spell magic on the huge area, and you suddenly realize you and your three companions are the only non shape changers around. Yeah. And cool. you're still not certain about that ranger because you got bit by a werewolf last week. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, well, I'm I'm picturing most of the time doppelgangers don't have their own cities. Although I suppose they could, yeah, they could have gradually taken over an entire city. They have uh, they have sub cities and they tend to work along like their 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 lines of subterfuge. Mm-hmm. They don't need huge amount of numbers to do it. They just put themselves in the proper key positions to effectively make what they want happen. Yeah, and they seem to be very, like, just by their nature, they seem to be individualistic, like, very much for themselves. Because there isn't a, a doppelganger deity or, you know, they don't follow... <gasps> what if the there is a doppelganger deity, uh, but nobody knows it because he's masquerading as a god he already killed? I, yeah, okay. <laughs> that would be kind of interesting for the players, is, you know, it's like a, you, the cleric of, uh, of Pelor finds the corpse of Pelor floating in the astral sea. Hmm. Oh no, where is he getting his spells from? <gasps> the Paylor that is currently being worshipped is a doppelganger deity. Although, it's funny because the whole thing about um, worship and in D&D, in the, the D&D world, is that the prayers and worships of the faithful uh, bolster their god and actually um, they tend to, to push their to god. To warp their directions. god, yeah, into certain... Uh, so it's, so. it's very hard to have a deity that isn't what he seems because the worshippers think he's this way and that would push him to be that way. So maybe he, maybe a doppelganger did take over from Paylor but then just became Paylor. Ah, but here's another counter for you. Is, uh, gods receive their power from their portfolio. Mm-hmm. Nairol doesn't need worshippers. Every time somebody dies, technically that's considered worship of, uh, of Nairol okay, and he yeah. gets a little bit of the power from that. So he doesn't need a lot of uh, cultists, a lot of worshippers. He's attached to a fundamental thing. So everybody worshipping this false Paylor is therefore properly attributing the, the whole thing is that uh, they have been fooled into worshipping you know, or, or believing in the falsehood and that's what's truly powering the, the, uh, the doppelganger deity. Except that it becomes true and then it's... <laughs> Or but it's not because <laughs> the very act of of, of of praying to the wrong god who you yeah. think is the right one is the portfolio and the domain of the doppelganger god. Okay. And so that that proves him right and vindicates his lifestyle, which is really what all the gods are vying for. Like my lifestyle is the most correct. Yeah. And so yeah, that's that's how it works. And so you know, any one of the gods can be a, like a, really the a doppelganger deity in disguise so long as they can keep fooling the, the worshippers into thinking it's actually the god, their prayers get converted into something that keeps him fueled as the doppelganger deity and not the false god. Yeah, okay. 
But that might be really hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around, and I'm completely okay with dropping the concept of there being any doppelganger gods. Okay. <laughs> Good, because I... Well, anyway. There could, however, be yeah. the concept of like a, a semi-Nirvana-type state. The doppelganger would, in this case, be uh, having transcended the concept of a self. Mm-hmm. They've lost the central part of the ego that that makes up the the mental personification of of all mortals, and so they are one mm-hmm. step closer to approaching that state of 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 ultimate you know potential. Okay. Yeah. And so in that case, the doppelganger religion is really just kind of you know abstract at best. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's what I'm saying about the doppelganger. Oh, although, yes, yeah. there is technically a doppelganger deity in uh, the Eberron campaign setting. Okay. <laughs> he's a wanderer and a trickster sort of thing. Yeah. As part of the dar- Dark Gods, he's kind of like the least evil, but he's still kind of malevolent and tricksterish. Okay. So, yeah, he goes from place to place and, you know, kind of plays tricks, steals stuff, but also gives out rewards to, to people. You know, just with no rhyme or reason. And yeah. so that's kind of what the doppelgangers do to emulate. Although, yeah, the, that's the thing about deities, too, is that um, shape-changing is almost a, a default. universal... Mm, yeah. yeah, it's every deity is able to shape-change and become something... In that case, a doppelganger can effectively worship any god and still, you know, have it be an appropriate one. Yeah, pretty much, I suppose. Yeah. They do have a wisdom bonus, so prefer, uh, preferentially the gods would like their worship because they are wiser than the average mortal. So, there is yeah. that. Although, I don't know if the gods would properly trust them with spells. They may accept the worship, but I don't know if they're going to grant spells to a doppelganger. Um, Not without a lot of proof first. <laughs> but, uh... But I think there's some interesting concepts to be had that just no one has followed through with as to doppelgangers, like, what's up with them? Yeah, yeah, they're just... Yeah, well, wouldn't that be a nice uh, series of books <laughs> to put out when 5th edition comes out, you know? Monster class, what's up with them? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, uh, so, not just D&D, too, but, like, people don't... I don't know, is, is a doppelganger a thing that people use in stories and stuff, or is it just kind of... Uh, uh, they're never mentioned prominently. They're, they tend to be like, uh, you know, like uh, for like X-Files, they'd be a monster of the week. Yeah. Which is a shame, because, you know, you expect that's like, oh, you know, the aliens have found this, you know, like human mutant that can change its shape, thus they find out the abilities to engineer it, now they can do such and similar themselves. It doesn't really work that way. There's just a kind of a monster of the week, and, you know, it's like, oh, hey, which one's the real Mulder? Blam, it was him. <laughs> I got him right. Did they have a um, doppelganger I episode? I don't actually think they did that, okay. but I think X Files is a nice way to, to show, you know, like for a given series as to what they do. And what about Star Trek? Star Trek had Odo. They yes, they right? did have some shape or changes I guess he in was there. Different, like because he could turn into objects and like. Yeah, he was he was much closer to the mimic style, uh, right. you know, or at least an advanced sort of more primal doppelganger style. Yeah. Until the storyline where they, he got injected and wasn't able to change his shape anymore, but that was that it got rectified, it got fixed. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, and with him they really didn't do a lot for the shape changing because budgetary concerns. Well, yeah, every once in a while they'd have him yeah. shape change. But I yeah. recall one uh, series I cannot for the life of me recall the name, but they did have uh, a semi reoccurring villain that took a person's shape that was effectively a doppelganger. And every time they thought, oh, it was the right one, you know, and, you know, oh, it was this one, and he that gets hauled off by, I think it was the cops. For some reason, the conventional cops are able to handle supernatural, you know, creatures like that. Okay. Like I said, I don't really remember much of, of the series, except, you know, the, the concept that uh, is, um, he's like, okay, they, they send him off to, to the jail, and everyone manages to walk away from the scenario, and then it, like, zooms down to the basement of the building they were all in, and there's one of them all bound and gagged. Hmm. And so the actual doppelganger manages to just walk away free. Yeah. Uh, you can see them in the comics from time to time. There's chameleons and you know, other shape changers. Mystique is a nice example. Yeah. Um, Mystique, though, for her, her motive tends to be, you know, the mutant agenda. Or, you know, her loved one. She she had a lover. She's had a couple lovers throughout the years. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, like her, her reason... Um, I have a love-hate thing with uh, with Wolverine, so I'm going to try and make his life miserable right now. 
Yeah. Because that's the stable uh, part of the relationship we're in at now is uh, the revenge part. Now, and does she has her own look too? Like she, like her natural state. It looks. I gotta like say, her natural way. state is a lot better off than the standard doppelganger appearance. Yeah. In almost every iteration, doppelgangers kind of look like a bad clay with veins. Yeah. Uh, she she has style, and that's why I do like Mystique. Is even in her natural form, she's got style, man. She's got flair. I mean, she walk around just you know like, oh hey look, I got this cool kind of spiky blue skin, yeah. and I'm all slick backed hair, and look at me, I'm stylish. Conceivably, she doesn't need to to do much aside aside from keep her away from you know the mutant haters. Mm-hmm. But she could just lead a normal life. It's like yes, I I have this power, this mutant ability, but I choose not to use it yeah. because I find it ethically questionable. Yeah, and then sure. oh my God, boy, boy, would people start thinking about like highly praise on her? Like uh, Storm is highly respected because she can do a lot of powerful stuff, but she doesn't go nuts and summon you know like a <laughs> oh, super good. thunderstorms and yeah. a dozen hurricanes you know all at once or thing. Yeah, she could, but because she doesn't, and she properly mentally controls herself and maintains that that nice level of I shouldn't do this because. Uh, Decent philosophy, you know, rationalizations yeah. going on. Well, that's sort of the difference between the hero and the villain. But you know, all Mystique needs to do is suddenly say, "No, I'm going to be me all the time. Yeah. I don't need to be other person." And then she, you know, doesn't. She can be wearing regular clothes. She doesn't even change to look like she's wearing whatever set of clothes, and she's technically naked wherever she's walking. <laughs> she she wears real clothes wherever she goes, and you know yeah. what? That's because. She's risen above it ethically, and bam, all of a sudden, she is a well-respected and very much, you know, like, oh, yes, we should definitely listen to what she has to say. But, yeah, would would people really... T- I think people it would be very hard to earn people's trust, though, as a doppelganger or a shape changer or, or something like if you can change your shape, because, like, you almost want to submit yourself to some sort of, like, put a radio tag on you or something. Mm. And and uh, that sounds bad on the other hand. Because yeah, I say, <laughs> you don't trust me. You don't yeah. trust me enough to accept it. Um, well, let's see here. I'm thinking, though, like, the X-Men have accepted Emma Frost not only into the ranks. She was effectively, like, the second in command at some point. She used to be the White Queen of the Hellfire Club. Hmm. Um, she has psychic powers. She can make you trust her. Mm-hmm. And yet they actually did trust her enough the the concept I mean heck the fact that they trusted Professor Xavier, I mean that takes a lot of trust building exercises. Is this what you believe, or is this what he wants you to believe? Because hmm. I know in the Ultimate uh, X Men universe that was played with a lot. Yeah. How much of that is their actual thoughts, and how much is something that Xavier put in as a you know like post hypnotic suggestion? Yeah. <laughs> and so you know if they can trust to be around somebody who can manipulate their very thoughts. Surely they can trust being around somebody who can change their shape. And it's not like Mystique can, you know, like, oh, it was Mystique was the cushion, you know, on the couch all along. No, she's only humanoid form as well. Yeah. She is effectively a doppelganger with added panache. Yeah. She doesn't look like a blob of clay when she's not her own self. Yeah, sure. <laughs> or maybe she does, and she just never assumes that. Her, her now natural default is the one she lets people think it's, oh, the blue form. I don't know. She's always hiding something, so maybe. But uh, but that's all it takes, and I could see, I could see a doppelganger getting a, a lot of respect of always being the doppelganger, of not prosing as anyone else. Um, and it, the other thing about um, doppelganger, especially in television and movies, is it's that opportunity for actors to be like, I'm not really myself. I'm someone else pretending to be me. Sort of that. I do have a very big fondness for that, uh, and whether they switch brains or it's a doppelganger, yeah. just seeing if the actors <laughs> can properly portray the other actor well enough yeah. that they start doing the fa- you know the little, little body expressions, so that you say, oh, that's so and so in their body. With you know, you come yeah. halfway through the episode, if they can pull that off, I believe that is a wonderful example of how good the actor is. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it only, even if it's only you know like a moderately you know well done storyline for for whatever they're doing, mm-hmm. it's nice to see. And I'm the kind of person that you know watch an episode again just to say, oh, okay, yes, they did get those little expressions. Like he does the hand motions when he says "person," and so the doppelganger, you know, as being portrayed by the other person, is doing it this way as well. Ah, oh, very nice, very mm-hmm. nice. So I don't know if everybody watches that when they're seeing that sort of uh, thing go on. I, I think I think yeah, you can notice it sort of if you don't notice it overtly. It's it's even better if it's sort of subconscious and you're like, that's 
that person doesn't feel like they're themselves. And, and that's the difference between uh, doppelgangers and pod people. Yeah. The pod people take your shape, but they do not take your personality. They may know the things, but they act like a pod person the entire time. Well, and I, I think doppelgangers done right should not exactly get the personality right. I think they should get many things right, but I think they should there should be little cues. Like, shouldn't you... In D&D, don't, do you get a sense motive check if somebody's a doppelganger? Uh, you do get a sense motive check, but they have some very nice bonuses. Yeah, because they're, they're, you usually have the bluff skill. And and that, and they can read your mind. So by the time you start getting like, I don't know if this is really the right one, they usually do this. Then they'll start, you know, like, adding that affectation. Like, he hasn't smoked a cigar once. This guy's usually <laughs> always smoking on a stogie. And he's like, oh, I've had enough of this. I need my stogie now. I'm not going to quit. I can't mm-hmm. bear this. And so I was like, oh, okay, yes, yes. Yeah. So that's why they gave those uh, situational bonuses on it. But I kind of like the idea, though, that if, you, if you're if you in an adventure as a player character and you're up against a doppelganger, there is some chance of noticing something off, you know. Or maybe they play their hand too full. I remember okay. uh, uh, a Justice League uh, episode where um, it was, uh, you know, uh, Batman is talking to the Flash, and the, you know, and... Uh, and he realizes within about five seconds that it's really Clayface. Hmm. How does he know that? Well, Clayface overplayed his hand. He played uh, the Flash as being like streetwise and and you know using too much slang. He overacted, hmm. which kind yeah. of fits being an actor himself. He he overacted, and Batman's able to figure it out. Hmm. However, later on, uh, the Martian Manhunter, who's a shape changer himself, was able to uh, change his shape and appear as Clayface. And he played it perfectly so that nobody was able to realize that their shape changer was really another shape changer in disguise. Ah, great. <laughs> uh, and now, is Clayface, is he made of clay? Or is um, not actually clay, but there was like a transformative thing, you know, like a, you know, oh, it's a new you, and he was able to really manipulate the stuff, and then he overdoses on it, and instead of actually just dying, he becomes like fully protoplasmic in, in nature. It's a clay-like consistency, but it's yeah. not actually clay. So, what do you what do you think of this composition of a, a doppelganger, like, and this connection to the go- the clay golem and the sort of you know the primal life? I think you mentioned this mm-hmm. in one of your origin stories, in that like maybe they're not fully formed, and like if you cut a doppelganger, do they bleed or do they like is it clay or something like that? Oh, yeah. so okay, yeah, that would be another interesting way to go. You could say this that they're. Uh, Doppelgangers are really half uh, earth elementals. Yeah, maybe some. It's just yeah. a clay or mud elemental. Yeah, with like, or maybe like a hybrid of, or yeah. of some some kind, like between elemental well, and. If flesh. demons can possess a body, what happens if an elemental possesses a body and it's like a yeah. clay elemental possesses a, a humanoid body for too long? What happens? Uh, well, maybe the body becomes more into you know ill-defined and distinct, and if you even like unpossess you know like uh, the person. What happens to the elemental? What if they spent too much time in humanoid form, in yeah. possession, and that's how a doppelganger came to be? So then they could be considered like a cousin species to dwarves in many mythologies. Yeah, because well, and humans are made of like well in in some uh, cosmologies, yeah, they're made from clay, clay. or earth or, or dust or yeah, and dwarves come from the earth or stone or something. like Yeah, that. in some mythologies, they're effectively you know. Uh, I remember. One, I think you may have mentioned, uh, maybe not on uh, uh, the, the, uh, the microphone, but uh, dwarves effectively being descended from like the, the titans of Earth and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And or, yeah, or like sort of giants and dwarves both. Yeah, and that. so they, they all come out. In that case, uh, you know, you could add doppelgangers to this, uh, this uh, you know, phyletic tree of things that have come from the primal elemental plane of Earth. Yeah, could be. They're just more towards the clay aspect than the stone. Yeah. Um, or you could even introduce like uh, you know uh, you know stuff that doesn't technically exist here. I remember well going back to WoW uh, mentioning uh, some stuff with Deep Home. Uh, they're equivalent to the elemental plane of Earth. Mm-hmm. That they have they have gems that just don't exist in the the prime material plane in in Azeroth. And that uh, if you have gems that don't exist there, what if you have like like ores and minerals and even base earths that don't exist. And so, mm-hmm. well, we'll jump over to the Magic the Gathering. They have flowstone and that you have creatures there that they're able to change from power and toughness back and forth. In which case, uh, 
the doppelganger would be like a flowstone elemental. That yeah. just, you know, managed, well, they evolved from it. Or, you or know, yeah, yeah. Ascended from, mutated out of, whatever or, your term is. Yeah. So what do you think about that as a concept then? Well, I, yeah, I think these are some cool ideas and sort of or maybe other things to add to the milieu of the mystery of, you know, which is real. Or I, I've had some nice uh, concepts of, of uh, well, the elementals as we know them are primary elementals. They're one element. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some yeah. stuff of, of uh, two elemental types combined together for secondary elementals. But these are always mm, more nebulous. Like you can add... Uh, you know, store you know like a water and and uh, and uh, air together to create a storm elemental. Okay. Yeah. And other times I see that it's just like oh it's fire you know and uh, and something else you know working back and forth between each other and they're not properly mingled. Mm -hmm. So a secondary elemental could have two elemental bases that combine differently. Mm -hmm. Like I've I've looked at it and said okay, you combine earth with fire, you could get magma. Or you could say it re uh, the fire refines the earth, and that's how you get metal. You have an iron elemental. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, that's how you get your adamantine elementals or whatever. Yep. Or what happened? What kind of earth has fire stored within it? Gunpowder. So you could have like oh. a gunpowder oh. elemental. Yeah. <laughs> and these could all be seen as, as nice combinations of, of two elemental types. So in which case, uh, maybe a doppelganger came from a, a secondary type elemental that. Uh, was clay and solid, but also flowed like the water. And so it yeah. was able to be so malleable, it became something untowards its own type and left the elemental state behind, yeah. became more complex and became the humanoid shapeshifters we know as doppelgangers. Yeah, there's another good one. It could also probably explain some types of oozes if you want to go with a non-divine and more elemental type cosmology. Yeah, although I like the ooze as because they... they I read about the um, real life oozes, the funguses and the um, not funguses. Well, are they fungus, fungus? Uh, ooze, molds, all sorts oh, of stuff. Oozes yeah. and molds that can nasty. actually like that can move. Like oh yes, creepy weird little things. Yeah. But the glory of life as it is. Well, and it's not nearly as creepy as the D and D version because the D and D version can actually <laughs> attack people. But uh, you know the well, hey, they can attack people too. Just you know, on the near cellular level. <laughs> yeah, they don't do a lot of good, but they can do it. Yeah, the fact that they combine together to create a gestalt thing, you know, is sometimes is quite interesting oh, too. Oh yeah, yeah. And that might be an interesting topic for another day too. <laughs> sure. Uh, of the well, ooze podcast. <laughs> well, oozes, uh, you know, and group stuff. We could, yeah. I mean, heck, talking about oozes that combine up to other things. You, uh, there was a few. Like a golems, uh, like a, a rubble golem, I remember seeing back in the the Dragon magazine, that you you knock it down beneath like so many hit points and it becomes two smaller rock, uh, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, rubble okay. ones, and that you have to knock them down to small size and then smash them to the last hit point before they finally go, you know, to pieces for yeah. good. Um, and you could work that up with uh, stuff like uh, like uh, the Power Rangers. Oh, they've got their stuff and they transform into something greater as their own. Okay. Yep. And so oh, we'll put a pin yeah, in this topic for that. maybe for some other time. And we'll have to put a pin in the episode too, or the iteration, I should say. We've uh, we've managed to hit our, our full length. Because, um, this is yeah, we've about talked for the duration of the time that we have. I want to remind people we have an email address. You can send us email the simulationist at gmail dot com. Oh yes, if there's a campaign setting, third party, like if I missed something in one of the older classic stuff, you know, if there's something on the character about like the. Uh, like the origin, please write us a note. Let us know. I would love to dish into that. I just have not been able to find anything. Uh, yeah, for sure. My gaming library yeah. is vast, but not complete yet. Uh, please come to our Facebook page and like us, the simulation, uh, facebook.com slash the simulationist. Um, and you can see updates. Uh, subscribe to the, if you haven't already subscribed to this uh, podcast feed and your favorite feeder like iTunes or Stitcher or etc etc um, go ahead and subscribe and is etc etc an actual one <laughs> I don't think so oh okay well yeah. we're going to reserve that name for ourselves if we ever you know come up with a, another competing feed and if you prefer to consume your podcasts on YouTube for whatever reason we are also available there uh, youtube.com slash the simulation well YouTube's, YouTube's very easy all you have to do yeah. is go there and, and, and push play at the uh, right one, so yeah, yeah, for sure, and so yeah, there are ways reasons why you might do that. Also, the other thing, our YouTube channel also 
I go on there and sign in as the show from time to time, and I'll add favorites and like things. So if you subscribe to that channel, you'll also see the things that I've been watching and I've been, that I think are related to the show, like uh, Standard Action and some other, um, just various things. I've liked and su- subscribed to other things, so... So I pass those on to whoever subscribes. Well, yeah, yeah. You subscribe to the simulationist, and it's not an end to itself. It's a means to others like it. You get to yeah. keep on branching. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so check that out and check out what, what we're subscribed to. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, and Twitter, at Spaceboot1. I, I occasionally tweet. I'm trying to do get more of a tweeting presence going on, but for now, it's just it's at Spaceboot1. Spaceboot1 is my Twitter account. Uh, I don't think you're on Twitter. Not yet. Okay. I'm looking at it and I'm seeing some nice stuff. I am, however, seeing like many like uh, people try stuff like with fake accounts, like with, with characters. Like, uh, oh yeah. It's like, oh, I, I read this comic and so and so. Oh yeah, hey, they start up a, like a you know a Twitter feed, a Twitter account for these characters, and they go on for a little bit and then they just kind of die off. It's like, oh, hmm. if you had kept on going, I might sign up to Twitter and just follow all that stuff and just hear the in character you know stuff of of all the wonderful things, but. Apparently, Twitter does, it does not suit well for that. It's best to just keep making comics. So, <laughs> just make actual comics. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, as a, I mean, the more you interact, like, well, like, what would this person say? The more you put yourself in their shoes, the more developed that character becomes. So, I think it's a good tool. It's just most, you know, seem to die off after about six months. So it's like, oh, they stopped doing that. Like, oh, that's three years ago now. Ah, oh, nerds. <laughs> yeah. Say lovey. Um, but yes, yes. Uh, so in the end, have I managed to persuade you that uh, doppelgangers deserve more of a look and more of a history than they've gotten so far? Uh, yes, yeah, I think so. I think it's worth worth looking into <laughs> looking into doppelgangers and, and uh, tweaking them a little bit. Well, okay, here we go. If you're from the future and uh, fifth edition's out and they've got a good uh, gaming license policy. Send us a note. Let me uh, get reminded us. Maybe I'll make up a you know a third party uh, splat book, mm-hmm. you know the the net book of doppelgangers, and I'll come up with a a nice maybe a nice twenty list of uh, like random uh, cosmology based things as why doppelgangers came to be, mm-hmm. and then I'll come up with some feats or whatever the equivalencies are in fifth edition for you know, things that doppelganger players can do and some way to have doppelgangers in your campaign as player characters. Yep, that'll we'll be see good. how it goes. Yeah. It's up to you, the future. It's up to you, <laughs> for sure. Uh, oh, and and Godicon. Uh, oh yes. One more mention. I think we've mentioned it once already, but it is coming up at the end of February. We will be there, and uh, we hope that you will be too. It is at the end of February, not the beginning, as it has <laughs> been in the previous couple of years. So pay attention. Go to the website and look around. Yeah, that's sign up. Godicon dot com. I yeah. think. W W I gotta go to this con. That's right. Uh, in you, Victoria, you should. Maybe they call it should con. You should go to this con. <laughs> should con. Well, that could be another. <laughs> uh, all right. I think we're all done. So, Take care out there. Yeah. Um, I've been Josh Trelawney. I've been Ryan Kirkby. Uh, Finland. Okay.